Over the course of Formula 1 history, the FIA has had to issue warnings to drivers for their on-track conduct. These days, they tend to issue penalty points, and if you, you know, accumulate too many of them, you get a race ban. Which is something that's happened, well, not that often, actually. The most recent of these bans was Roman Grosjean at the 2012 Belgian Grand Prix, the Turn 1 pileup that wiped out Alonso, Kobayashi, Hamilton, and a couple of others were involved as well. Now these are actually rare because in the last 40 years only 6 drivers have received a race ban for an on track pro gamer move or for having a massive accident on top of a multitude of other pieces of iffy driving. Those are Grosjean as just mentioned in 2012, Michael Schumacher in 1994 for that whole overtaking Damon Hill on the formation lap thing, Eddie Irvine was given a race ban because he was deemed to have caused the collision in Brazil also in 1994 that resulted in Martin Brundle being smacked in the head by Jos Verstappen's Benetton. There was Nigel Mansell in 1989, he reversed in the pit lane at his pit stop and got the black flag, which he ignored, and then collided with Senna. One driver you wouldn't expect to have been given a race ban was Mika Hakkinen. He was given a race ban also in 1994, as he was judged to have been the cause of an accident that wiped out several drivers at Hockenheim, and had already received a suspended race ban at the previous round in Silverstone. The final one is Felipe Massa in 2002, which wasn't exactly a ban. What it was, was that Massa had been handed a 10 place grid drop at the Italian Grand Prix, the first ever one as it so happens, for causing a collision. But Sauber parked Massa for the next round at Indianapolis and put Frentzen in the car instead to dodge the penalty. There is also Jacques Villeneuve in 1997 for the yellow flags at Japan incident, but he was allowed to race under appeal, so never actually served a race ban. He then won the championship, which is... Or peak Villeneuve really. Bans really are a last resort for the FIA. They don't want to do it, but sometimes they have to. And for five drivers to cop a ban in 40 years, that's pretty good going in terms of discipline within the sport. But what about being so bad that the FIA doesn't step in and give you a race ban, but they flat out take your racing license away? This happened in 2006 to a gentleman called Yuji Ide. You don't have to be an F1 fan for long to see that in the old days there were teams that were, to put it bluntly and honestly, slow. Teams like Life, who thought a W12 engine was a great idea, Andrea Moda, who was so badly run they are the only team to be forcefully booted from the championship. There are other teams that have had to endure the embarrassment of pre-qualifying as well, Coloni, Onyx, and so on. And when the grid numbers dropped following Andrea Moda's expulsion and Brabham's collapse in 1992, there came a point in 1994 that saw 28 drivers going for 26 slots on the grid, 26 slots being the maximum that the FIA allows. When Simtek folded mid-1995, it meant that there were now 26 drivers going for 26 slots, which meant, under the rules at the time, all you had to do was log a lap. It didn't matter how fast or slow it was, you just had to complete a time lap. It could be 20 seconds slower than the pole time, but you'd be on the grid. No issue. So in 1996, a new rule was put in place to stop these slower teams taking the piss, and to ensure that anybody on the grid was going to be competitive, to an extent, and to make sure that anybody turning up to race was actually going to try. This rule was the 107% rule. In the 1996 season, there were 12 times a driver didn't qualify. At Melbourne, the Nürburgring, Barcelona and Silverstone, it was both 40s that failed to make it in. At Imola, one of the 40s, Montermini, would fail to qualify, but Luca Badoa and the other 40 made the grid. The other times that a driver didn't qualify in 1996 was at Hockenheim, Belgium and Japan, all those non-qualifications being Giovanni Lavaggi in the Minardi. In 1997, the only instances of a non-qualification were the two Lolas at Melbourne, while in 1998 there were five non-qualifications, all Ricardo Rossit in the Tyrrell, who somehow managed to finish ahead of Olivier Panis and Jos Verstappen that season. But just as a quick note, at the 1997 Australian Grand Prix there were some other non-qualifiers but they were allowed to race because well, Villeneuve was just way too quick. So the FIA basically said, right, okay, you, you, you and you, you can race, but you two, Rossit, Suspiri, you know, credit card salesman, you're not racing, do one. And actually if you look at the way that Mastercard was sponsoring that team, that joke isn't very far from the truth. So fast forward to the mid to late 2000s, 2006 to be precise. Formula 1 has entered a new era. The Schumacher dominance was over. Fernando Alonso stood tall as the man that ended the streak, and there was also another man there who was starting to show that he too could be a multiple champion, even though he never would be. And that's Kimi Raikkonen. 2.4 litre V8 engines, except in the Toro Rosso, and the cars were starting to sprout a myriad of aero appendages to try and give back the grip that the FIA was trying to strip away. 
But while the F1 media was preoccupied with the whole Schumacher, Räikkönen and Alonso thing and who out of those three was going to win, there was another team that was propping up the other end of the grid. A team set up as a Honda B team and run by a bloke called Aguri Suzuki, who was a former F1 driver. That team is Super Aguri. Honda had purchased the British American racing team and had also replaced Takuma Sato with Rubens Barrichello, who was now free from being the Michaels Labrador. The problem was Takuma was very popular in Japan and the Japanese public wanted to see him racing. So Honda helped to create this B team so that Sato could race and also be an all Japanese team powered by a Japanese engine. But it wasn't without its problems. All 10 teams had to unanimously agree to allow the team onto the grid, but the Midland team, which became Force India and now Aston Martin, kept blocking it because of concerns over reduced TV revenue. But eventually, Super Aguri was allowed on the grid. It's quite reminiscent of this whole Andretti thing, isn't it? The car had its roots in the old TWR Arrows outfit from the early 2000s. Suzuki had bought the cars off Paul Stoddart, the old Minardi boss, who in turn had bought the cars off Walkinshaw when Arrows went under in 2002. These 2002 Arrows A23s were updated to 2006 regulations and then had a B-Spec Honda V8 dumped in the back. Super Aguri had planned to build their own car but money meant that wouldn't happen, so they just upgraded a 4 year old car even more. As you can imagine, it didn't really do much. Suzuki was intent on promoting Japanese talent through this team. They already had Takuma Sato who was a proven talent in Formula 1 if a bit crash happy, but the other guy in the other car was somewhat of an eyebrow raiser. Yuji Ide. Because Ide wasn't your typical F1 rookie, he was 31, he had no European racing experience, and he couldn't speak a word of English. He was 4 years older than Raikkonen, 7 years older than Alonso, and only 4 years younger than Coulthard who was one of the more experienced drivers on the grid. That said though, he had finished 3rd in Formula Nippon in 2004 and 2nd in 2005. Now Formula Nippon is what is now Super Formula. E-Day's first race in Bahrain, which was the first round of the season because of the Commonwealth Games being held in Melbourne that year, didn't go well for him. He would start 21st on the grid of 22 drivers and that was only because Raikkonen hadn't set a time because his suspension failed in the first qualifying session. Tiago Montero, starting from the pit lane, is another asterisk to put to things. E-Day was 8 seconds slower than Alonso's Q1 time. 8! He was 3 seconds slower than Sato. 3! and he was 9 seconds slower than Schumacher's overall pole time. 9. Still, in the race he lasted longer than Villeneuve, Fisichella and Albert's the 5th Musketeer. 35 laps before his engine went, but his pace was woeful. He was on his own at the back, literally just turning laps. The ones he completed without spinning, that is. At Malaysia, he retired again after about 33 laps. His qualifying pace was a little bit better and he was only 1.7 seconds off Sato and 7 seconds off Fisichella. He also outlasted five other drivers in the race, Kleon, Weber, Coulthard, Rosberg and Raikkonen. But his big break would be when he finished in Melbourne. But it was 13th and he was three laps down on the leader. A full lap behind his own teammate and two laps behind Albert's Midland that was probably the next worst car on the grid. Also at this race weekend he was accused of blocking Barrichello while Rubens was on a flying lap, which resulted in Barrichello starting 16th while his teammate Jensen Button got to start from pole. And then during the race, he spent more time spinning than Massa did at Silverstone in 2008, and that takes some doing. But then at Imola, the nails in the coffin started to be nailed in one by one. At the start of the race, Ide caused a lap 1 incident with Albers where the Midland was pitched into a few spectacular rolls. But Ide somehow continued, retiring on lap 23 when the suspension gave out, probably as a result of that collision. It also didn't help that Suzuki had probably dropped Ide in the proverbial as he was on record as saying that he hadn't done much testing because the language barrier prevented him from learning what he needed to learn. So why were the two Super Aguris allowed on the grid? This is because the 107% rule had been dropped, and it had been dropped since 2003, which is when they switched over from the 60 minute 12 lap session to the sort of one lap YOLO qualifying session. Had the 107% rule been in effect in 2006, Ide would not have qualified for three of the opening four rounds of the season. The only round he would have made the grid for was Malaysia. It wouldn't be until 2010 that it was reintroduced, when the three newer teams came in, Virgin, Hispania and Caterham, or Lotus, whatever it was. After the San Marino Grand Prix, the FIA took Suzuki aside and told him to bench Ide so that he could get more experience in testing and get more up to speed. Literally. The stewards at Imola had also reprimanded Ide and warned him that his performances had to improve, with Suzuki also saying after Melbourne that his seat wasn't safe. Super Aguri would put Frank Montagne in the car until the French Grand Prix, and then Sakon Yamamoto would fill out the remainder of the season. 
But on the 10th of May 2006, the FIA revoked E-Day's super license, and it's the only time in Formula 1 history this has happened. It was later reported that in preparation for the 2006 season, E-Day had only done 200 kilometers or 125 miles or so of testing, while Honda had done 20,000 kilometers, McLaren 17,000, Ferrari 13,000, and so on. The estimates are on your screen. So you might be thinking then, how the hell did Ide lose his license while the likes of Grosjean and Maldonado got to keep theirs? While Grosjean and Maldonado were a tad crash happy in their time in Formula 1, they could get a car on the grid with a competitive time. Maldonado won a race. Grosjean has 10 podiums to his name in Formula 1, one of those being in a canal boat of a Lotus that was achieved while bailiffs were in the pit lane, ready to seize the car so they could pay off debts. Ide's Formula 1 career lasted just 4 races, totalling 53 days. Your mental statistic for this video is that Liz Truss, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, lasted just 49 days, handing in her resignation on the 50th day. Which isn't really a fair comparison, because one was a useless waste of space that did nothing but cause carnage and was totally not qualified for the job that they were in, and the other is UGE Day. See? Who says political comedy can't be fun? F1 Racing Magazine called E Day one of the five worst drivers in history, and I'd like to see who the other four are. The race said he was more of a capable driver than he appeared to be, and was hampered through lack of prep and a language barrier. After being dumped by Formula 1, he went back to Japan, racing in the 1000 kilometers of Suzuka in Super GT in 2006. Now, During that race, he hit another car and then ignored the black flags, leading to a disqualification. In 2020, he would win a championship. He won the TCR class in the Super Taikyu series. I love Japan. Everything is super something. Super GT, Super Taikyu, Super Formula, Super Aguri. Now I want to watch Takeshi's Castle. It makes you wonder then what would have happened if Yuji Ide had been given a bit more prep. Okay, he wouldn't have been a world beater, but how much further up the grid would he have been, or how much closer to Sato would he have been? Now these days, thanks to the likes of Hamilton, Verstappen, Leclerc, Norris and Russell to an extent, the bar for rookies in F1 is ridiculously high. Especially now, they only get like five days of testing before they're thrown into a race situation. Yes, they've got simulators and stuff like that and academy drivers and all of that stuff, but it really does make you wonder if E-Day and drivers like him are the reason for the FIA eventually consolidating the racing ladder so that it looks less like a pyramid or some deformed Christmas tree, depending on what series you include, to be an actual ladder. F4, F3, F2, F1. Ide is a bit like other drivers, the likes of Rossit and guys like that who are looked at as a bit of a joke, a bit of a meme, something you can laugh at, but it's proof that in F1 you can't just turn up, get in the car and go. You need preparation, you need to be fit, you need to be this, you need to be that, and it does help to speak English. And Ide didn't have any of that at all, really. So then, a look at the only man in Formula 1 history to lose his FIA super license. If this has taught you something new, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job, and subscribe with the bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive thanks to the patrons and channel members for the continued support, and if you want to help out on a more personal level, the join button is there underneath this video so you can join as a member and get access to you know, emoticons and stuff like that, and there's also a link to Patreon in the description, where there's also links to Discord and to my socials. Well, a super thanks if you just want to do one of those one and done donations. So until next time, I've been Aiden Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Right, get that window open, it's boiling in here.